going to be embarking upon a new study, and um, we will be in Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to be here for about two months. Um, Proverbs 15 has 33 verses therein, and we will be looking at about 10 of the verses in Proverbs chapter 15. Of course, what I'm going to do with you is help you understand backdrop and context to uh, the whole book of Proverbs, as well as Proverbs 15. The book of Proverbs is a set of prose. They are framed in um, uh, paradoxes, triplets of wise sayings that hold their own independent thought and, uh, and, and content, but they are also part of an integrated whole that's why the book is called the Proverbs of Solomon, really the parables of Solomon. So there is an overarching theme and an overarching uh, narrative that frames the book of Proverbs. I'll talk more about that on uh, Friday as we go deeper. You know, Friday is our two hour plus class, so we can really go in today. We're going to just be hovering around some principles that are laid out under points number uh, one. And two, and maybe I'll just touch on Proverbs 15, one a bit tonight, but I doubt it because like all scripture requires uh, serious meditation and serious thought. We want to make sure that we're able to land on the uh, the main meaning of the text as a consequence of understanding the larger context of scripture. So I'm going to open us in a word of prayer and we're going to begin to deal with what is called uh, theology 101, and then the uh, spiritual and practical wisdom of the Proverbs from chapter 15. Father, we thank you for your kindness today. We thank you for inclining our hearts one more time. And as you said in Proverbs 16, 1, the preparation of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. Help us to understand the absolute necessary relationship between the heart and the tongue so that we might praise you with our lips because they say exactly what our heart has been taught by you. We're asking your grace upon the community of believers all around the world in whatever situation they may be in. Help them as we're asking you to help us by your spirit and to do what your servant said. Open our eyes that, might, that we might behold the things out of your word that are wonderful about you and marvelous about you and help us to appreciate over this series words even as words are designed to glorify you because you are a god of words and your people are to be people of the word and help us to honor you in these matters so we come to you lord again on the grounds of your son's suffering the blood he shed to wash us cleanse us purge us and to sprinkle us clean we might approach you on the grounds of his life which is our righteousness imputed and our standing before you irrevocably unchangeably immutably for all eternity you are ours and we are yours for christ's sake and bless us now with the humility to be students and may your spirit teach us what the word of god has to say about these matters we pray in jesus name amen Amen. So I'm going to open up by uh, starting with the title of our, our series. Uh, you might want to take notes. Otherwise, what I have been recommending for 26 years is to take the lesson and listen to it at least how many times? Yeah. Ten times. Minimally ten times. Um, the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom and their choice words are what we are about to deal with. Now, if you've heard this term, the word of wisdom before, what you will know is that the word of wisdom is one of several gifts of the spirit given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about two mechanisms for communicating the word of God, actually three, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the gift of languages. Those are the three vectors or mechanisms for communicating God's thoughts to humanity. And the Proverbs are words of wisdom that the Spirit of God has given us in the anthem or volume of the book 
Um, are all of the outlines up there, Craig, at, at, in the back on that? Where are they? Do you know where they are? They're all gone? Yeah, we need way more. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, good. Because um, we got a lot of guests and uh, we need to be looking at our outline as we work it through. As I was stating, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge are two gifts that you would see employed in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark, Luke, and John. And there's a difference between the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And I'll just share it with you so that you can know it. It'll, we'll build upon it as we continue in the study. The word of knowledge is merely revelation given by the Spirit about events or situations that God would want people to know in advance before it occurs. This happened a lot in Christ's ministry where he would tell the disciples to go hither and yon and do this. Somebody will meet you there and they'll tell you what to do. Just say the master sent for them and they will help you. They will guide you. That's called a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge was used by Peter in, in, in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira came in and Peter summarily disclosed that they had engaged in what we're going to talk about a bit tonight and later on, allowing Satan to fill their heart to lie to God and to the Holy Spirit. And that word of knowledge set Ananias and Sapphira up for total damnation. The difference between a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom is that a word of knowledge is simply data and information laid out on a prophetic level where you know somebody knows something in advance about something that's going to occur. The difference between knowledge and wisdom is that wisdom is a word of instruction to guide you in a behavior or a practice for your good and for God's glory. That's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Like you can gather a lot of knowledge, but that doesn't mean you are gathering wisdom. And so with the Proverbs, the character and nature of the book of Proverbs, it is a relationship on three tiers, a father son relationship, a king servant relationship, and then a husband wife relationship. Those are the three covenant frameworks we understand that governs the universe. So your Bible will open up your in the Proverbs. My son, take heed to my instructions. So we are once again back at that. That model of, of uh, subject-object relationship where the father is talking to his son. That's where we are in Proverbs 15.1. So you might as well uh, sort of capture the idea that what we're listening to in Proverbs 15.1 is how the father teaches his sons how to behave in a world, particularly in a world filled with conflict. When we get into the latter uh, uh, chapters of Proverbs, chapter 22, 23, 24, you will discover that the Proverbs are speaking from a magisterium standpoint. It will talk about the king and talk about his servants. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, Proverbs 24, 25, and it is the honor of kings to search them out. So at that point, you hear Proverbs about the relationship between a king and his servants. And then we move toward the end of the Proverbs, chapter 30 and then 31, where it's talking about the bride of Christ under the uh, rubric of a virtuous woman. And it closes in Proverbs 31, where Solomon is told by his mother to make sure that he understands what it means to be a sober and a wise king who loves his wife well. And that's the way it's broken up in what you can understand as a triad, a triad. This is a concept of threes. That's what triad means. Now, I want to help you understand the backdrop to this thing called the parable of Solomon and the scriptures as a whole. Your Bible as a whole is the word of God. And the word of God tells us about history from three vantage points, and they are also a triad. Now, some of you have, have learned theology from me, biblical theology, systematic theology, and you know this. There is an aspect of biblical revelation that tells us that God knows everything from the beginning. That's what the Bible says. Will you pull it up? Acts 15, verse, Acts 18, uh, Acts 15, verse 11. I'm, I'm almost sure that's it. I haven't been there for a while. Acts, there it is. Uh, let me see. No, nope. Acts 18, maybe Acts 18, 11. 
I'm messing it up. It'll come back. Known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world. It'll come back in. Oh, I'll reverse it. Acts 11, 15. Let's, let's see if it's Acts 11. I'm, my dyslexia is kick, kicking in. Uh, and go to verse 18. Acts 11, 18, maybe. No, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be broke if I started gambling today. I'll, 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 p I'll pick it up a little bit later. It's in that portion of scripture. If you guys pick it up, just audibleize it. Just audibleize it. You got it? Okay, 1518. There it is. Known unto God are all his what? From what? That means when God engages a beginning point for God, he's not learning anything. This means that for God, there is a before the beginning. Does that make sense? Before the beginning. And then the beginning has its own essence. And that beginning runs all the way to the what? To the end. In theology, these three categories are called uh, protology. Pro always means before. Tology are the idea of ology means study. Pro study. This is where God shares with us the fact that he knows what he's doing before he does it. It's called protology. The, um, the second category of revelation in scripture, we call this biblical theology. Biblical theology. And biblical theology is really the historical outworkings of scripture from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22 and 21. So you have what is called protology. Then you have biblical theology. That would be the history of scripture, how that God created the heavens and the earth, chapter two, chapter three, so forth. That's called biblical theology. OK, so the Bible gives you like a historical narrative of the unfolding of creation and the the creation of mankind and then the first family and then the larger extended family and then the lineage and genealogies of the nations as we have chapter 10. This is called biblical theology. Biblical theology is kind of the history of God or as we say it around here, biblical theology is history according to who? Jesus Christ. That's Psalm 40, verse 7. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will. That's very important. This is called biblical theology. And when we get to the end time, when the end comes, we have another kind of theological discipline. Do, do you know what that's called? Eschatology. Eschatology. You guys hear eschatology a lot, and there are four fundamental views around eschatology, but it has to do with the end times. Again, that's what is meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when Paul says, then cometh the end when the Lord Jesus will give up the kingdom to the Father, everything will be subject to the Father, and God will be all in all. So there is a uh, before time, and then there is in time, and then there is the end of time that goes into what? Eternity. And those three are the triad that make up your Bible. And if you can keep that in your mind, it's going to be helpful in relationship to the way, way the Bible talks. In fact, what we're going to be looking at as we work through Proverbs 15.1 is that triodological framework or the framework of those three categories. For instance, pull up chapter 15, verse 1, which we're headed to, but we're not going there. Because what we're going to do is actually begin to develop an appreciation for what it says on the larger backdrop level. I want you guys to look very carefully at Proverbs 15, 1. This is where we're going to be by the time we get here on Friday. Listen to the to the phrasing. Listen to it. Proverbs 15, 1 says a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. Do you guys see that? That statement is not merely meant for you and I to try to pick and choose and determine what it is meaning on a mere horizontal relationship level. 
That statement is actually an overarching expression of how God deals with the whole of mankind from the beginning of time to the end of time with regards to our relationship to how you and I behave with each other around words. This statement is an adumbration of all of human history. Think about what that statement says. A soft answer does what? Turn away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. Now, the central concept that I am calling your attention to are words. You will mark that everything in our life circumscribes around words. Everything. Everything good or bad, everything helpful or hurtful are all about words. Words are something that God has chosen to use by which he is revealed to humanity. And words are also something that God has chosen to use by which you and I, as his image bearers, are most capable out of all of his creatures to glorify God with. Words are also a manner in which you and I relate on a horizontal plane with each other and on a vertical plane with God. It is for this reason your Bible says in the area of biblical theology. Now, that's not before time. I'm going to quick quote that in a moment, but we're in time. John said in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. That's in the beginning. John is actually giving us a revelation of the agency that created everything. John wasn't talking about what was before the beginning. John was talking about what was at the beginning. Okay, I want you to understand at the beginning was the what? Word. And John means for you to understand that. And that word is a person, is it not? Who is that person? Right, so it's important for you and I to understand now that as we get into the study around words, this is not a small matter. Because you and I have used words, all our life in a way that does not correspond with who God is, we have messed up our life seriously. So my point is to help you begin to get a handle on the relationship between words and God in the context of wisdom and foolishness. It's really important because if you want to look back at your life and think about all of the areas in the past where you have largely either encountered or made horrific mistakes, they all are circumscribed around communication, conversation, and words. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? All right, so as I continue to lay down the backdrop, because grace has been taught well, so I don't expect grace to be ignorant of this, as we are dealing with the things before time, what is that theological term? Say it again. I need you to get it, because you need to, look, you can learn it, because my kids learned all the stuff I'm teaching you, they learned it. I, I taught them these things because you can learn things. All you have to do is be open to it. Pro in the Greek context means before. All right. Like when you provide something, you are working beforehand to bring it to pass like a provision. OK, so pro always means before. And then we are talking about in time. What do we call that? Nope. In time is what? Biblical theology. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to trouble you. I'm going to trouble you. I'm going to trouble you because you're not listening. I'm going to trouble you uh, because you, you want to be able to learn. And the way you learn is by listening more than talking. This is the way I used to get shredded by my professors. Because the there is a way in which we listen that's not careful and that is you're talking while you're listening and so you'll actually say some things that you don't even agree with with yourself but you opened your mouth and spoke not really thinking about what you were going to say and that frequently happens in church 
particularly when we're doing studies. And I want you to benefit from what we're going to be dealing with in the Proverbs 10 verses in 32 uh, sets of chapter 15 we're going to be looking at and Proverbs 15 is one of them and this is what I mean when you are sitting in anybody's class or under any kind of discipline or in any kind of meeting on the job whatever don't be the first one to speak like be really thoughtful because what I did was lay out some ideas for you under that triadological framework and the first one you got protology I said so what's the next one some of y'all said eschatology so I know you weren't careful. Am I making some sense? But the notes were right there. You wrote them down. So you didn't even look down. So this is about being able to bring your body into subjection to your mind so that your body can actually correspond with what you have just been provided to keep you on course. All right. So that second category in time is called what? Biblical theology, because biblical theology deals with what? History, according to God. Another way we put it is his story. His story. Everything in time is his story. Everything before time is about God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the ending, right? But he's before things begun, and he is after things ended. Because God is eternal by nature. And so under the before time protological um, stance of God, protology, we have what I call a redemptive solution. I want you to know this. Before time, God had already provided a redemptive solution. Does that make sense? I want you to capture this. Because when you are able to study your Bible with God's mind, you won't make major mistakes when you're able to kind of understand that God is the big backdrop. He is the context. All texts have a context and God is the context. And when you understand that God is from eternity to eternity and that God doesn't change and that he doesn't learn anything, which means he knows everything from eternity for God, there is no discovering of anything but an unfolding of his mind and thought from eternity into time as a means by which he is glorified by his creatures. Does that make some sense? Okay, good. So when I say that before God created the heavens and the earth, he had a redemptive solution before the heavens and the earth found themselves in the mess that we're in. Does that make sense? All right, it's important. So this is how a good parent provides for his children even before they come into the world. So when mom and daddy decide to have kids, you know what they do? They do what is called preparation. Is that true? Well, that's what God did. Before God decided to have kids, he prepared some things. First thing we discovered that God prepared was a means to keep his relationship with his kids intact before he had them. This is Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. I want you to capture it because this is going to help us respect the issue of words once we get into the study. Before the world began, you know what? God had a redemptive solution to the problem that he knew he would have with you and me. And that redemptive, that redemptive solution would be that Jesus Christ would be the lamb slain before God even creates the heavens and the earth. Notice what the text says. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So you know what that means? And this is in your outline under point number one, sub point A a redemptive solution. What that really means, ladies and gentlemen, is that the triune God actually agreed in covenant conversation among themselves to make sure that there would be a solution to a problem they knew that would occur in the world. Did y'all get that? Right. And this is why all things will glorify the father through the son, because before God created the world, the son said, yes, I will be the lamb slain in order to secure a relationship with humanity, because if we don't have this agreement among ourselves, they're going to ruin it for themselves. 
Because we know our character. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are holy. And they are just and they're righteous. And they're merciful and they're kind. And they're gracious. And they chose to make sure that there was a plan of redemption before they created humanity, which they knew at some point in time, not too long after creating them, they would create a mess out of everything. Does that make some sense? So again, we go, Father knows best, doesn't he? And the Lord Jesus is the son, and the son is always that model of him who obeys the father. Is that not true? So I'm helping you understand what we're about to deal with. So under protology, there's a redemptive solution, and that redemptive solution is the blood of the lamb. I want you to get that. Now we're moving into this time dimension, and this is going to be more to our point. In the realm of time, in time, something happens. Do you know what that is? A conflict of words. Did you get that? Right. All you got to do is look at your own outline. Sub point B. A conflict of words. Do you see it? So I want to help you with that. This is where we're, this is what I want to lay down. I want to help you understand that God knew that when he would create us in his image and in his likeness, one of the fundamental qualities that make us different than every other creature on the planet is high levels of intelligent articulation. What makes us different than the other animals is we can speak with levels of broad vocabulary depth. And we can actually do things from the standpoint of being created in the image of a God who himself talks. All relationship, all endeavor, all business, all programs, all uh, enterprises are the consequence of conversations. Are you guys hearing me? All forms of relationship, every kind of institution, every kind of interaction is always predicated on words. And so it's important for you and I to understand that in this time dimension, this is that second category, biblical history, the whole of biblical history up to this very moment that you and I are in is a conflict of words. Am I making some sense? So God speaks in Genesis chapter one, let there be light, verse three, that's God talking. And then it says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, God's talking things into existence, is he not? And then God said, when he created man, it is very good. Then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. And so he made a helper for man, right? And then Genesis three, one opens up and guess what? God knew that another conversation was about to get started. And it would be a conversation that would create conflict for the rest of human existence. You keeping up with me? So that's what we get in Genesis chapter three. And from that point on, there has been this conflict of words between men and men and between God and man and between God and angels and between angels and men. This conflict of words it's the struggle and the matrix and the vortex and the difficulty and the painful agony that you and I are right now struggling through in our life. The conflict of words. The conflict of words is underscored in Genesis chapter 11, verse four. I want you to hear it. Listen to the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham and Japheth. After maybe a few hundred years of coming out of the boat where God had already destroyed the world by a flood because every imagination of the thought of man was only evil then. And what you're getting ready to learn is words are a consequence of thoughts. And you should already know that, but we're going to drill down into it. And so God doesn't wait until you say something before he knows what you're thinking. That's what the whole Genesis 6 narrative was about. This is what I shared with you on Sunday when I said the Holy Ghost strives with men. He referees with them. He doesn't just go, what did you just say? No, he goes, what did you just think? Because what we're about to learn is you think before you speak. And so if your thoughts are raggedy, your words are going to be raggedy. 
And this is what our series is going to be about altogether. Remember what God had said back in Genesis 4 to Cain when he was thinking about killing his brother? Cain, sin is lying at the door and it wants to take you. He wasn't talking about an existential sin entity. He was talking about Cain's thoughts. This is what was in Cain's heart. God called him before he said it out loud. And that's the God that's dealing with you and me. So I hope you understand that. Now listen to how this verse opens up. Now this is your pre-Babylonian one world government agenda attempt. Here it is. And they what? What are they doing? And to whom are they talking? One another. Notice what it says. And they said, go to, in the uh, English version. Like, All right, now let's get about it. To build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now watch this. And let us do what? So not only are they talking about doing something, they're talking about stealing God's glory as I taught you before. Now notice what the scriptures are doing. Because this is Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive and sharp and quicker than any two edged sword. And it's able to actually divide asunder. That means it opens up. It fillets the body or the anatomy of the mind and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent. Not just your words, thoughts and intents. It pierces deeper down into your intent mechanism than you are even aware of. This is why we want to learn God's word because we would want to be proactive over against our own malicious intents, which we can't always pick up on. Like you and I just discovered we can't even pick up on the words that are often coming out of our mouth. That's contrary to what we're thinking. Like we just did when we said eschatology instead of biblical theology. So this is where learning how to harmonize your heart with your mind before you speak is extremely important because what you're going to learn in the book of Proverbs is that uh, a wise man is careful with his thoughts, but a fool just poureth out foolishness. He opens his mouth and just lets it run. Right, because he does not know how to manage his thoughts or his intents or his motives to actually make sure that his words actually reflect what he's thinking. And you know how you've caught yourself going, why did I say that? Right. And so and many things of that nature, they're simply a consequence of a lack of discipline. That's what you and I want to work through today. Notice what it says. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, I've talked about this with you before. What the word of God does is it shows you how God pays very close attention to the way we think. That's what he's doing right there, isn't he? And then God lets us know this is how they think. This is what they're saying. This is what they're doing. So under this second category in time, my argument is that you and I are dealing with a conflict of words all through human history up to now where you and I are. I want to share with you one more third category, however. So before time, God gave the blood in order to deal with this conflict of words because this conflict of words created for us enmity against God. Did it not? It turned us into God's enemies. And this is the thing I want us to be able to work with today is not today, but Friday more, more uh, specifically and precisely to be careful that our words are not reflecting an aspect of our heart that fundamentally is waging war against God. Because you can even be a child of God and your words can be wrong because your mind is not right and your heart is distracted or going in the wrong direction. And as Jesus had to reprove the disciples constantly about that, you and I can be being used of the enemy to dishonor God with our words. I don't think I have to persuade you of that, but I want to actually help us through the study, learn how to properly assess our heart and harmonize our heart with our thoughts so that what comes out of our mouth glorifies God. It's extremely important for you to learn this because you can. You can't do it perfectly, but you can. And so what this enmity and this enemy aspect does, it, is, has, it has created for us as humanity a warfare, has it not? We're all in a warfare and we are either at war with God and your mouth tells on you. Or you are at war with the enemy who's at war with God. Because according to the Genesis narrative, he started the war. 
Y'all got that? The devil started the war. Now, God knew the war was going to start. He had already told your mama and your daddy, don't cross the line. But the devil said, hey, I need teammates to fight against God. And from then till now, it's been a war of words. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Very important. Now, our Bible gives us a beautiful picture of what I call a final solution. If the blood is what God thought was necessary to remedy this word war, and it, and it is, is it not? Did not just take us through like five to six applications of Matthew 6 as the release mechanism from conflicts that come with words? And, and what was the essence of our study about? One fundamental thing, forgiveness. Did y'all get that? How that forgiveness is a key component in overcoming conflicts of words. Now, forgiveness is rooted in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So before time, God established a provisio of forgiveness so that we can be liberated from the conflict of battles by just simply saying, I'm sorry. Are y'all keeping up? So now here's what goes on throughout time. God has been gathering his team of soldiers and the devil has been gathering his team of soldiers. And the book of Revelation from chapter 17 to chapter 19 shows us the two battles. We've been there before, right? Him who rides on the white horse with those who are called faithful, true, right? Chosen, faithful and true. And then you got the devil and his cohorts, right? And they are rising up for one hour to make war with the lamb. You guys remember that, right? Now look at Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 4. I'm just want to I want you to get this because the way your Bible closes out, it closes out with what I call a final resolution. And that final resolution is really a final solution. Look at chapter 19 verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 4 and watch what it says in verse 4. Uh, and after these things, I heard a great voice of many people in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Verse two, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornications and hath avenged the blood of his what? So apparently there has been a conflict going on and on an earthly level, the whore has been putting to death God's servants. That means there's been a war of words. Has that not a war of words? The people of God have sought to represent God. The whore works with the beast and the false prophet and the dragon to wage war against those who are on God's side. And frequently those on God's side are often put to death. Because the world doesn't want to hear what God has to say. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But now watch how it continues going on. Verse 3. And again, they said, hallelujah, and her smoke rolls up forever and ever. People who actually understand the implication of this means that God finally intervened. He destroyed the Babylonian system. And smoke is going up everywhere while the saints are shouting hallelujah. Now look at this next verse. Ah. Uh, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen and Alleluia. Verse five. I need to run. I need to run. Run. Ugh. Let's see here. No. All right. I know what I want. I want verse 10. I want to go all the way to verse 10 through verse 14. I left out my is verse 14. Now watch this. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see to it that you don't do it. I am your fellow servant and of the brethren that have the testimony of, of God, uh, testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the what? That's right. And now watch what he says. And I saw heaven open. I should have started there. In verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and what? Who is this a description of? Jesus. Jesus. This is where your Bible's closing out. A warrior king, the Messiah, the, the, the Hashim. We're about to see this. This is Jesus closing out history as a great warrior about to conquer all foes. 
all rhetorical wars, all word wars, all propositional arguments, all systems, all ideologies, everything that builds itself around conspiracies and, and plans and machinations to go after God. What the Bible tells us is he's going to destroy all of them. And we're getting now a composite of who this person is in his total warrior motif. Now watch what it says in verse 12. Revelation 19, 12. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many what? That means he's gone through the nations, subduing all the kings and taking their crowns and owning them. On his head are many crowns. Now, this is apocalyptic language. Remember, you cannot be locked into natural three dimensional uh, uh, concepts or ideas. He must have a big head to have a bunch of crowns. But he is king of kings and lord of lords, is he not? And he will subdue the nations, will he not? Now, watch what it says in verse uh, verse. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. Now. We do know that name now because it's revealed to us. There's a deeper aspect of knowing it that takes time to unpack. Now listen to verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in what? That was known before the foundation of the world. We talked about that, didn't we? I, I will be the lamb slain from the foundation. This would be a bloody history of humanity since the fall, wouldn't it? Right now, watch what he says. He says, and he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called what? The word of God. Do you see that? So you have the word of God in the beginning and you have the word of God where? In the end. Now, notice what it goes on to say, because you're getting a depiction of him who has the final word. Verse 14, and the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, who would be these armies? The holy angels and the saints. Now, see, you, you, you get a chance to look at what how God views you is just whether or not we correspond with that vision. Notice what it goes on to say. Verse 15 and out of his mouth. Do you see the picture? And out of his mouth goes a what? A sharp sword It's describing the character of his words. A sovereign king. This is in the Greek, a Ramphia sword. It is a long sword that the Roman used to cut off heads in execution. Roman soldiers cutting off heads in execution, capital punishment. And the depiction is that God will come in the person of Jesus and put an end to all word wars by his own word. Look at the language again. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. I'll stop right there because if you want to, you can go into the studies. We've already been there. When you follow Revelation chapter 19 all the way through, he demands the birds of the air to come and eat all the flesh because everybody has been destroyed in this great battle who opposed the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point that I'm making here that I think you're beginning to get. And then I'm going to move into point number two in our outline, going back to Proverbs 15, is that in the history of mankind, as God sees it, the battle is a battle of words. It is a battle of words. And humanity has been engaged in that battle of words um, against God. And God has been engaging in this battle of words against men as well. And under point number two, all words are a what? Okay, they are. At least for true believers. Now I'm going to quote some verses. I want you to meditate on them with me. So one of the things we're going to be doing is, is, is asking the Spirit of God to cultivate our hearts. Cultivate our hearts, because out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. I want, this is what this study is going to be about, a, a harmonizing of our heart with God so that what comes out of our mouth honors God. Listen to David, who said in Psalm chapter 19, verse 14, these words. Psalm 19, verse 4. Let the words of my mouth. All right, so just listen. Let those lines sit. Let the words of my mouth. Now he uses a conjunction, 
and the meditation of my heart. Do you see it? So what, what David knows, as I know, and you should know is, you really can say one thing with your words or your mouth and be saying something else in your heart. This is called hypocrisy. Now, the only way for you and I to keep from hypocrisy is if we really have a vital, ongoing, unfiltered relationship with God. Now, what a beautiful request this is. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the musings, the ideation, the profundity of reflection that goes on in my heart before I speak, let both of them be acceptable in your sight. Do you guys see that? Right. That's a huge request. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a huge request. That's the request of a son in time wanting to reflect the son who is in glory. That's the request of a son in time who knows that the son in glory, when he was down here, always had acceptable words with God and acceptable meditation with God. This is why I'm taking my time with you, because you and I can never appreciate the word of God without a backdrop. You can never appreciate a verse without its context. You cannot appreciate the context without the larger backdrop of the text, like I'm doing now. Because I want you to be able to be aware of, this is called Coram Deo, that God is deeply involved in the way we think and the way we talk. And the outcomes of what we say are a consequence of how serious we are maintaining allegiance with God both at the heart, meditation, contemplation, deep ideation level internally and what comes out of our mouth. It's really true, child of God, really true. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my what? So he's seeking out two qualities from God that are helpful. He's saying, God, you have to strengthen me to think right. You have to strengthen me to talk right. And when I mess up, I need you to be my redeemer and bring me through the blood again so that forgiveness can release me so I can go on back to working on harmonizing head and heart so that what comes out of my mouth is acceptable in your sight. Y'all got that? All right. I want to say that under point number two, there are five sub points, A, B, C, D, E. The first one is they are the vocal expression of our heart. What is? Words. Words are the vocal expression of our hearts. Words are the vocal expression of our heart. You don't ever say anything that does not come out of your heart. You just may not have a soldier at the gate between your heart and your mouth for your conscience to know what just happened, which makes you a fool. Right. Listen to what it says in Matthew 12, 34. I'm getting ready to run through this so you can get it. Matthew 12, 34. Listen to what it says. In Matthew 12, 34, the Bible says, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil do what? So stop right there. You caught the paradox. And it came from Jesus. So like you could argue with me. People love arguing with PJ. They love arguing with me and they can because I'm a fallible man. But the one speaking here is not fallible. You know what he just said? He says it's not possible that if you're evil at the core of your being, that you can speak good things. Did you hear what he just said? I want you to get that. Oh, generation of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? Because at the root of the matter, is the heart. Listen carefully. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? There is a whole mechanism, enterprise, dynamic process that goes on inside us 
that actually formulates the words that come out of our mouth. They are rational. They are propositional. They are ideations. They are emotional. They are uh, bio psychological or psychosomatic. What we say is a consequence of not only what we think, but the environment surrounding us that feeds us data that shapes our emotions and impacts our perception and hence we speak. In other words, there's a feedback loop that takes place with you and me because of the environment we're in. Am I making sense? I'm going to say it again because I want to lay these foundations because maybe what God will do for some of us as we work through Proverbs is give us a greater level of personal intelligence. Intelligence about ourselves. Intelligence about ourselves. And then social intelligence. Intelligence about our environment. Because like some people might be a little bit aware of their own idio. That's the idea idio means self. Syncratic. I've used that term for decades, haven't I? Idiosyncratic. Syncratic means the process by which you operate. Syncretism. Idio is self. The self-processing dynamic that you go through that makes up your personality and who you are. We all have an idiosyncratic composite or, if you will, uh, dossier. People know us over time by the way we act and largely by what we say. Am I making some sense? Right. So when Jesus says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, what he was saying to all those rulers at that time, it's not even possible for you guys to say good things because your heart is bad. Right. So under the first sub point, they are the vocal expression of our heart. Our words are the vocal expression of our heart. And what I love about that is if you don't know yourself well enough, listen to what you say. So if you listen to what you say, wait a minute, what you, Jess, man, did, did, Jess, did you just say? And then I go, yeah, I did. Man, what did you mean by that? I'm, I'm not real sure. You better find out, brother, because I don't know if what you said was right. That's called self-assessment. It's called self-reflexing. It's called self-indexing. It's object-subject relationship with yourself. It's self-talking to self. And the Bible tells us to do that. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Right. It's very important. So now, sub point B, not only are words the vocal expression of our heart, but they are our response to our what? That's what I was just stating. So when a child is born, a child is known to be a child for one fundamental reason. And I'll demonstrate that this is a corollary both in the physical and in the spiritual dimension. The child has no capacity for intellectual speech. When a child is born, they do not speak. Did you get that? They have to learn to speak. And the way they learn to speak is first by listening and watching. By listening and watching. Their first objective is not to say stuff. It's by listening and watching, even in the womb. They're listening and they're watching. And when they come out of the womb, they're watching and they're listening. This is why a newborn baby in Christ shouldn't be doing as much talking as much as they should be listening and watching. Because that baby listens and watches for a long time. And in their mind, they're starting to develop a vocabulary. Because they actually want to enter into what God made them for, vocal communication. And you'll notice over time, they'll start going, uh, 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 Because they want to now get in on it. Because they listen, they listen long enough and watch long enough and they reading it. They getting it. They reading it. They getting it. Because what they're watching is an environment that caters to developing for them patterns, cyclical patterns. The environment is helping them grow to understand 
who they are in light of where they are. Like your identity is never the consequence of the exclusive you apart from anything. You are always the consequence of a dynamic between object and subject. You are always the byproduct of people sowing into your life. No individual identity exclusive of input. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? You have fundamental DNA traits that will emerge over time that are a consequence of your connection to your parents. They play a role in your identity. But largely what plays a role in your identity are the environmental nurturing factors that help you learn how to communicate to those in the hierarchy of your attention. So a child is going to be most competent and assertive and in some cases aggressive to want to talk to his mama or his daddy like me and Barb used to battle. Which word is going to come out of their mouth first, Gracie? Papa or mama? And most of the time, it was papa. Now, we had a kid, so I'm, I'm not sure if it was five to three or four and four and four and four or five and three and, and five for Barb and three for me. But it was frequently for me and I was happy enough about it. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm breaking the pattern with that an example and then I'm coming back because here is why I say if you don't know why frequently a child will go papa before they go mama is because I preached to my children in the womb. While they are in the womb, I'm reading scripture to them. While they are in the womb, they're listening to daddy's voice. Daddy's voice was first. I talked them out of the womb. Do you hear me? I talked them out of the womb. So when they came out, they just go, oh, that's what you look like, brother. I've been listening to you for nine months. You loud, man. Because <laughs> they, Barb would sit up under the preaching. She'd sit in the Bible study. She'd sit in at home Bible study. She'd sit, sit in the devotion. And when I'm out doing missionary work, guess who there? Pregnant Barbara. I'm trying to show you how God works. And it's important for you to get this. People that learn how to speak first, listen well and observe well. And this is why the Bible tells us as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the communication. Because what it does is it takes you out of what is called the nepios state, Hebrews 5. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews says, when you are a babe, you are unable to speak the word of righteousness because you don't know it. But as you grow, you become more competent and you can begin to dialogue in theological terms. Does that make some sense? And over, a, over time, as you're growing up, you go from being a nepios to what is called a technon, a technon that's called a child of God. The technon is the child that now is taking on the image of the parents. And this is how that child is kind of known because when they go to talking, they sound like mama and they sound like daddy because they are owning the lingua franca of the home. This is the techno that Jesus talks about. He frequently uses that concerning the disciples. He calls them little children. Have you ever noticed how strange that was that Jesus would call grown men little children? And that's because he's dealing with them not on a practical level, but on a what kind of level? Spiritual level spiritual level and they are his children these are the children whom the lord hath given me so jesus had huddled his disciples around him he knew they were babies and y'all know they were babies because they did a lot of stupid goo goo gaga stuff that we already know right i'm talking to all the disciples didn't they go dumb a lot trying to learn how to talk Trying to learn how to talk. So what I'm sharing with you, I'm being humorous about it, but I want to I want to encourage you to be ready to go deep with me. Because it's important to make sure that if we're going to represent our father, 
we actually understand the importance of words. Right. And so the next sub point that I want us to look at here is sub point C. Oh, by the way, Proverbs 15, 28. I'm going to take 10 more minutes and we're going. Listen to Proverbs 15, 28. This will be one that we will unpack, but I might as well just show it to you here. The heart of the righteous does what? What's studying? What, what's studying? What is studying according to that verse? The heart. Listen to it again. What's studying? The heart. The heart is studying. Not the mouth. I'm in chapter 15. Chapter 15 is all about the mouth. You got to understand that. Paul is all, I mean, the Hebrew writer Solomon is always contrasting heart and mouth. Like I'm trying to tell you by a literal ana analogy. You don't talk from anywhere but your heart. So your heart has to study to talk. Does that make sense? That's all I'm saying. Pay attention to the words. Don't don't be quick to answer. I remember getting rebuked by uh, a professor many, many years ago. It hurt because I was just a little bit off of the verse that he was having me to look for. But it was because I rushed. He says, no, no, Jesse, that's not the verse. And all the other brothers, pastors in the room were looking at me like, I'm glad you the one got in trouble and not us. I got in trouble because I was rushing to answer it. And I answered it wrong because he said a nuance that I missed. I went, Ugh! Right? I didn't catch that little nuance. Now, I wasn't wrong in general, but I didn't have the right verse because I didn't catch the nuance. I was rushing to answer before hearing. He that speaketh before he heareth the matter is folly and shame. Am I helping you? That changed my life from that day forward. That changed my life. And it wasn't that I was so proud that I couldn't be rebuked by him. Dr. Massey was just, he's a prominent, he, I think he passed now, but he was a prominent African-American professor across the nation. So if you're going to get rebuked, get rebuked by one of the big dogs, right? <laughs> the heart of the righteous studies to speak. It thinks about it, weighs it out. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things because he doesn't control his heart. He doesn't control his heart. So point C, they contribute significantly to good or what? Do you see that? Look at Proverbs 15, 18. Proverbs 15, 18. And these are passages we're going to peruse and look at as we make our way through the eight studies we're going to do. Probably going to be about 10 or 12. A wrathful man does what? It is. That's Satan. That's Genesis 3, 2. Hath not God said. Y'all got that? That's Satan. So you got to keep the larger spiritual optic in view. Are y'all with me? That's Satan. A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he that is slow to anger, what? That's verse one of our text. Now, what is a fundamental characteristic of the one true and living God? Slow to anger. Isn't that his quality? And as, as such, does he not have the methodology, methodology and mechanism and tools to appease strife? Isn't that what the text is teaching? Can you see God in that? Can you see Christ in that? Can you see the Holy Ghost in that? Can you see how God doesn't have to rush to get into a fight? Oh, I'm going to teach right here. I got, I got about a minute before I let it go. I'm going to teach right here. So people swing at God all the time. They swing at God all the time. They want God to swing back, Brother Matt. But God saw that punch coming before they great, 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 it didn't ever catch him by surprise. He said, oh, right about now he's going to swing at me. And God lets men swing by blasphemy. All manner of sin shall be forgiven the sons of men. Blasphemy of the father. Blasphemy of the son. Is God slow to anger? 
So I'm showing you how the characteristic of God has to be an essential component in developing our language. Starting with the heart. Let me go on because I want to finish up and then we'll come back and deal with uh, point three, which will be the beginning of our study in Proverbs 15. Is this making sense to you guys? So point D, they are also generated by the presence of God or who? Either God is present, guarding and helping you manage your words or Satan is. So two verses we're going to look at briefly. Luke chapter six, verse 45. There's just one. Now watch the language here. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is what? There's a logical syllogism here. Good man, good heart, good treasure. Good man, good heart, good treasure. Does that make sense? Now there's none good but God. So if a man is good, he had to be made good by God. And it really means he has just been brought into fellowship with that which is good being God. Does that make some sense, child of God? So we never own goodness ourselves as an ontological quality, but it's a shared quality when the spirit of God is in your life. When a man is made good, it simply means God is present to approve of his or her speech because they are in communion with each other. See, that's what David was saying back in Psalm 19, verse 14. Lord, let the preparate, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable before they come out. Am I making sense? All right, listen to it. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak. So what I'm sharing with you is you and I have to be very careful that as we're trying to be part of a kingdom by which we want to employ our words for God's glory, we want to understand the relationship between the heart and the head and the mouth so that we have a discipline around what we say for good. This is Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. And then I'm going to just call your attention to the word list down at the bottom of your outline. And we're done for today. And we're going to pick up on Friday and begin some deep sea diving. So bring your scuba deer. All right. Right. And, 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 and your oxygen tank, too. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife. So the possession so easily can unpack this. And they kept back part of the price, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is called hypocrisy. This is called trying to manipulate people by your actions because your actions are words. This is what we're going to learn. Your actions are words. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your what? Now stop right there. So this is the occupancy of the devil, God's enemy, in Ananias' heart. This is called the word of knowledge. The gift of the word of knowledge, 1 Corinthians 12. Peter didn't know this. No man can judge another man's heart. You can't tell if the devil is operating or if God is operating or the flesh. Peter just received a word of knowledge, did he not? Now watch this. So the heart was filled by Satan to do what? To lie. To lie. That's to speak. That's to speak. Now we know that the devil is the father of what? And these two church folk lied to God. Do you see that? They lied to the Holy Ghost, which means the Holy Ghost is a person. He's not just a wind or a force. Don't misrepresent him. He's intelligent. He's powerful. He's missional. He has an indexing quality. He will tell you to do this and tell you to do that because he has personality. That means you can lie to him. 
and you can tell him the truth and you can make the Holy Ghost happy and you can grieve the Holy Ghost. Didn't we learn that last week? And grieve not the Holy Spirit, which was given you. He's the resident Lord. Right. So this is about this series of studies we're going to be doing in Proverbs 15 is really about having a more effective relationship with God in terms of God's presence and our honoring his presence. Because here's what I believe goes on with Christians a lot. I believe that Christians, they love God, but the relationship with God is so raggedy uh, that they fundamentally neglect to honor him in his presence. Now, don't think that what I just stated is absurd because what James says is, how can you love me whom you cannot see and not love your neighbor who you see? So what John is doing is John. John is saying, you Christians be lying all the time about, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, stop. Stop. Songs like that is going to send us to hell. They're going to send us to hell. Am I making sense? Right. Now, I'm going to let y'all off the hook. I'm going to let y'all off the hook by one more portion of scripture. This is why you have to be taught how to worship. That's what we're trying to do around this place. Teach people how to worship. Now, this is going to be James chapter three. I'm going to read this. James chapter three, verses one through ten. And James is going to let you off the hook. PJ ain't going to let you off the hook. Brother James is going to let you off the hook. And you're going to be able to drink your wife. Woo! I am so glad that Brother James came to the rescue. And I needed him many years ago. Listen to what James says. My brethren, be not many teachers. Didaskalon. That means master means an educator of the Christian faith. Like everybody want to be a pastor, be a teacher, be a prophet, be this. James says, you don't want to have a whole lot of people in the midst acting like they know God. I'm just letting you know. Don't be many. Don't rush to be teaching. And here's the reason why. Knowing that we, because James was included, shall receive the greater what? Like I've already said this before. Y'all ready? In hell, the lowest part of hell. I mean, I'm talking about the smack dab bottom, the hottest part of the sun, the, the globe up there, that ball of fire, which hell is probably infinitely even more hotter. The hottest part of hell is for preachers. Because preachers pretend that they know God so well that they're more accountable than anybody else in the tier of the Christian rank. Are you hearing me? Now, the next category of people right after preachers are lawyers. Because <laughs> lawyers twist words and that's what we've been dealing with in our culture for years lawyers learn how to twist words so preachers learn how to manipulate them so they can get in your pocket get in your pants you know the preacher you know them. these are false prophets God hates them hates them but the people love false prophets and when the people get in trouble they go to lawyers these hell is going to burn in other words, preachers like myself and lawyers, we're going to keep hell burning forever. I'm just telling you, it's going to be bad uh, for, for false prophets and false teachers. Verse 2, James 3, 2. I'm almost done. 
For in many things we offend all. Really, that construction should be for in many things we all offend. Y'all got that? Now, this is where your conscience has been uneasy through the whole study because, you know, it's me, it's me, oh, me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The, the, the study, get a hold of you because, you know, uh -uh, Pastor Jesse, I didn't know you were going to take us down this road. <laughs> For in many things we offend all, and if any man offend not in word, if any man offend not in word, he is a mature man. You got that? So I'm trying to show you and that that literal word means mature. You can take it as perfect. And in that context, if we take it as impeccably perfect, that's only referring to Jesus. Do you understand that? Because there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There's none good. No, not one. Do you understand? There's none that understand. There's none that seek God. There's none righteous. No, not one. Except Jesus. That means everybody else has sin. That's John 1, verse 7 through 9. He that said he has no sin, he is the devil's child, and the truth is not in him. So, like, everybody got to deal with James 3, 1. All of us, except Jesus. He came and he went, never one time thinking a bad thought about his daddy or saying a bad word about his daddy. And you and I are laboring to be like him. Does that make some sense? So all we're going to be doing as we study through Proverbs 15, Brother Mac, is praying a lot for the Holy Ghost to help us keep our mouth shut while he trains our heart so that what comes out more times than not. Because see, what I want to do is get my batting average up. I don't know about you. I just want to get my batting average up. I want to get above 500. Can I get to 700 or 800? Can I get to where out of a ratio of 10, seven times I can see it right and three times maybe it's marginal? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then I'm going to ask God to give me a, the presence of mind that when the three times show up where I mess it up, I hurry up and jump into the font filled with blood, flowing from Emmanuel's veins to cleanse me from the guilt and stain of a corrupt heart that would say something that would harm somebody un improperly or does not glorify God. All right, that's it. 